We'd like to welcome you to the Northeast Pans Pandas Parents Association first conference ever. There's three goals for our association. One is to provide an opportunity for parents to meet and come together and see that you are, you're not alone, you're not isolated, that there's a lot of us. And another goal is that we help the medical community and the clinicians that are trying to help our children. They are working tirelessly day and night, the majority of them, and are really trying to help us. And so if there's ways that we can help them, we want to be able to do that, not just today, but moving forward. And um, we'd like to try to help expand the quality and treatments. There are people here from over 30 states and Canada, and there's doctors, there's over 100 doctors here from different states from across the country. Collectively, in this room, we have spent over $3,309,550 to try to get our children well. I have the true honor of introducing our next speaker, Diana Pullman. Diana started Pandas Network in 2009 when her son became ill, and she has spent the last five years helping desperate parents find answers, connecting doctors and researchers, funding research, and promoting Pans and Pandas awareness throughout the country. There is a tsunami of need. Our needs as families have far outreached the medical community's recognition. This is a grassroots movement. We're continuing to try to get doctors to meet each other. Actually, Tanya Murphy and Beth, Beth Latimer, other doctors, had expressed that often parents don't have any material about pandas when they go into doctor's offices. So we created the first ever um, brochure on pandas. So when you're a, a new patient in a doctor's office, you have a little bit to read about. Um, what is pandas? How does it affect your family system? Possible tests you'll do, you'll, you'll do. Let's learn from these amazing doctors. With no further delay, I'm going to introduce Dr. Susan Sweeto, the hero, <laughs> chief of pediatrics, neuroscience, and IMH. Forget etiology. All you have to care about is the acute onset of neuropsychiatric symptomatology and the fact that it isn't just OCD or an eating disorder, but that they need to have two of the other seven categories, ADHD, behavior change, and during acute exacerbations, choreiform movements. They're only present on the stress neurologic exam. Not all children with OCD and tics are in the PANDAS cohort. The other pieces are separation anxiety, very abrupt on overnight onset of kids who can't leave their parents' side, or in many cases can't leave the home. The dilated pupils and the fight or flight reaction that so many of our kids get, hypervigilance and hyperarousal. Emotional ability and irritability, laughing, crying, screaming for no good reason. Behavioral regression, uh, closer to 80% of the children have urinary symptoms. And then the short-term memory problems, toric or sensory abnormalities. These are the kids who are acutely unable to wear clothes because of waistbands or other problems. And we were able to take and correlate times when the child was having tic uh, flares and see the difference in handwriting samples. Then we could also correlate those with their anti-streptococcal titers and that's how we made the connection that every exacerbation is either triggered by a strep or after it generalizes by another uh, infectious or immune stimulating trigger. Acute onset OCD following chickenpox, influenza. More recently, the H1N1 influenza outbreak had a tremendous amount of pans associated with it, and also with mycoplasma and Lyme disease. If you don't find strep, that doesn't mean it wasn't an infectious trigger. It just makes it a little bit harder to figure out what you're going to treat. So it isn't every strep infection. It's only those who have these antigens on the cell wall that look like the human host. We've talked about this as an autoimmune illness. I'm going to change that to something that's much more correct. It's a misdirected immune response. The fact that there's a very strong correlation in timing between months in which strep is ubiquitous in the classrooms and periods when children are having observable tics and behavior problems. If you do a throat culture on a child presenting with behavioral problems, including urinary symptoms, and the throat culture is positive, treat it, eight out of the 12 children had complete remission of their OCD symptoms. There are two categories of medical emergency. One of them is a child who is now refusing to eat, either because they have scrupulosity concerns, that they feel guilty, they're not worthy of eating, fear of choking, fear of vomiting, fear of um, contamination. Second source of emergency is the children who have life-threatening behaviors. They have the impulsivity, irritability, and they're trying to jump out of a moving car. IVIG for those severe disabling cases, and at least IVIG, possibly plasmapheresis for the life-threatening ones. If your child has some OCD, some tics, 
There are many other things that we can use before we have to go here. Use the diagnostic criteria, medical workup, look for strep. We now know that children who are in at least their second episode, and many times in their first episode, like our index case, will have a positive throat culture at presentation. Do an adequate throat culture all the way back into the oropharynx. Many pediatricians don't know that a lot of strep infections present with headache or stomach ache and some low-grade fever. Ask them to do a workup for a urinary tract infection. When it's negative, ask them to then go ahead and look at a throat culture. We're so grateful for having this meeting and also all of your parents is that it's really making a difference one physician at a time. If we can educate every single physician, we can make a big difference. <laughs>